we have to roll up our sleeves beyond our Python programming skills and enter the world of code debugging. The exploit author already confirmed in his dialogue, this looks to be a structured exception handler-based exploit. There is a community debugger, which has been used for a long time on 32-bit applications, of which this is one of, that can be used to debug the actual assembly code when it's running. And Oli Debug happens to also have a plugin to scan for safe SEH and ASLR missing in compiled code. Well, what does that mean? Well, safe SEH is a technology to protect the structured exception handler table from being overwritten. And if in the 32-bit world, applications are not compiled with something called the slash safe SEH switch in, in most compilers, certainly in the Microsoft flavor, then that particular module, whether it's a DLL or an XE, will not be able to protect itself from having that pointer, that structured exception handler, from being overwritten, potentially making it vulnerable if there's a buffer overflow scenario like there is here. ASSLR is address space layout randomization. If that is not compiled into the code, then the code will load into memory at a fixed relative virtual address making it potentially more exploitable. Unfortunately, at this point, the rabbit hole gets deep and quite kind of time intensive, okay? Because when you enter the world of debugging, you're entering a really iterative and experimental place where you have to be very, very persistent to get these things to work. The structured exception handler records reside in the stack uh, and the call stack is for every function call that the application makes, right? In every thread of the application. And they are there to handle runtime exceptions gracefully. Uh, the SEH record itself consists of a pointer to the exception handling code and then a pointer to the next exception handler record in a chain of exception handlers. The, this forms in computer science terms what's called a linked list. Now, an interesting side note is that 64-bit compiled programs today are not vulnerable to SEH exploits because the safe exception handler table validation code is linked into the actual binary itself by default. On the other hand, 32-bit compiled programs can still be vulnerable to SEH exploits if they are not properly linked with the SEH table validation code. So can we verify that our app is actually vulnerable using a debugger? Well, yes, we could use Oli Debug. We could use the safe SEH plugin to scan the XE and DLL modules. We could even run the application. We could attach to the process with Oli Debug uh, and uh, you know, see what we get. So that's what I did. I downloaded Oli Debug onto my system. I pulled in the safe SEH plugin. Uh, and then I ran the plugin and I looked and sorted by uh, essentially module name. And sure enough, and it shows up in bright red in the plugin, the very first three components of this application, i.e., the two DLLs and the XE itself, in the applications directory have not been compiled with safe structured exception handling code uh, nor uh, ASLR. If I believe the plugins output, right? So that's exciting to me because that means we have two things at play here. We have the ability potentially to overwrite the structured exception handler table, and we have the ability to find executable code inside of any one of these three modules that will be potentially loaded at a static address. We can also go through and verify a few other things. Uh, the initial x86 assembly trampoline was the instructions call EBX, right, that we were looking for. Uh, and they were supposed to be located at the relative address 0x1008FB3, uh, right, according to the exploit code. So we can dive into the memory map in Oli Debug, and we can take a look to see if at this particular address, those, uh, that opcode is located, right? 
Now we could first look where that address is and ex from an ex excitement point of view, we find out that it's in the text or the code section of this IPW SNMPv5 DLL, which we earlier discovered was not properly compiled with safe SEH, thus is vulnerable to structured exception handling overflows as well as static code locations in memory. We can also disassemble some memory. When we try this for this particular module, we very quickly find that it's not four byte aligned. That doesn't matter because we can jump to any address in memory if we have control of the instruction pointer. And so we could go to this specific address, 1008FB3, and then disassemble. And sure enough, we find FFD3, which is the opcodes call EBX. And those were the opcodes particularly that we wanted to target to make our exploit work correctly. The second opcode sequence was POP EBX, and that was supposed to be at address 022C0012. On a Windows 10 system, when I was experimenting with this application and the exploit, that memory page was not even mapped. I couldn't see it. And in fact, this turns out to be uh, the very reason this exploit won't work on Windows 10 plus a little bit of padding problems, right? Um, so I went to look for it, couldn't find it. I initially thought, well, maybe I just need pop EBX as a pointer into some other executable uh, section of memory. Uh, and I modified the memory address to see if I could get it to work, but I could not. And in fact, it turns out this is not the issue. Uh, pop EBX just happens to be the very first opcode that needs to precede the actual shell code. Uh, once I got over onto Windows 7 system. So I did a fair amount of analysis here, sort of tracing this through, right? Anyway, we can go ahead and use something like OllieDB to run the application attached to the process and then fire the exploit. And we can validate the exact same behavior as the, exact, as the application showed us. If you remember, the application showed us an exception and it showed us an address of 42, 42, 42, 42. When I put the application into Ollie Debug, I attached to the process, got it running and stable, and then I ran the exploit. I discovered that the address 42, 42, 42, 42 ended up in the EAX register, uh, at which point the uh, the code threw an exception because that's not a valid uh, address in the virtual memory segment, right? And uh, it turns out that, at least on Windows 10, the padding is essentially was too long and forced this 422 into the EAX register, and then it just uh, threw the exception, and that was as far as it was going to go, okay? I was not able to validate that the code execution was actually transferred to the shellcode. So boo, that's unfortunate. All right. But because I don't want to do an entire class on uh, structured buffer overflow development, and we really don't have time, let's sum it up with what we've actually learned today. Okay. Small Python scripts, first of all, can be converted from version two to version three relatively easily if we understand the byte object and the string object challenges that are in front of us, as well as some of the keyword differences, print being the number one culprit there. You know, related to that, Python 3 has its own distinct string versus byte object, whereas Python 2 does not. And we need to make sure that when we're doing exploit development work, that we represent our data as byte objects themselves. The struct module in Python makes it very easy to pack addresses into byte object buffers with that helpful endianness indicator so that we can actually get the byte order of the addresses in proper little endian form if, for example, we're working with an Intel-based processor, which always interprets memory in little endian form. And then furthermore, we learned that the socket module can be easily used in Python to open up a TCP connection to any remote address and port and send data to it. Miscellaneous and related to this, we have a clear finding of a vulnerable app in this example. Uh, 
non-ASLR and non-safe SEH DLLs and axes are certainly a really significant problem if we find them. And then, of course, turning our unreliable exploit into a reliable exploit happens to be real work. Uh, and for the purposes of this uh, presentation, I did not finish that work on Windows 10. I did, however, take this exploit and the debugger over to Windows 7. And what I discovered was the exploit works not 100% reliably, but about 50-50%, more or less. And the reason for that is in the virtual allocation of memory on Windows 7, sometimes we were lucky enough to hit that address uh, 022, I think it was. I'll go back a little bit. Yeah, 0x022C0012. Sometimes we were lucky enough to allocate the buffer for the input overflow in that memory range. And other times it got the page was allocated in an entirely different memory range. And so the exploit based on the virtual memory allocation strategy is not 100% reliable. That was the conclusions uh, that I came to working with this particular exploit. I do believe it is portable uh, to Windows 10. I do also believe that we probably would have the same uh, virtual memory allocation challenges in trying to uh, get a reliable uh, exploit working. But you know, even if we have to fire the exploit four or five times to hit that memory page, it's probably not a terrible thing. And that, folks, is the end of the presentation. However, if you want to see the exploit working on Windows 7, I might have a Windows 7 box here that I can show you. Here is a Windows 7 system that is running the exploit. I am going to restart this exploit on Windows 7 really quick. In the debugger, uh, this is kind of hard to see, but I just want to sort of go through the exercise really quickly. All right, and here you can see the application coming up with its login prompt. I hit OK, and there's the running application, right? And then over here, we actually uh, can look at the exploit really quick and just double check the addresses and the offsets. They look correct. The number of bytes looks correct. Uh, and then we can uh, go ahead and uh, exploit it. And we do get our overflow. Uh, and we can see, you can see here, if you look very closely, that in EAX up here, we did get the address 0x22C0012, but we got an access violation writing to that address. And that means that memory page is actually doesn't exist in the memory space of this process. And so that was a failed exploitation. If I run this again, couple of times, I'll probably get success, right? It's it's kind of a, a hit or miss exploitation that, uh, situation that we're looking at. All right, folks, that's the end of the presentation. I really hoped you enjoyed yourself today uh, and uh, that you uh, perhaps learned a thing or two. And if you would like to join me for the Python class, we can talk a whole lot more about the language itself and uh, get you on board with doing some Python proof of concept scripts yourself. Jeff, thank you for that. That was very techno -fairy. We had a lot of questions inside here. So for the last few minutes where we've been capturing those, I'd like to uh, give those over to you and see what you get. We have a, uh, was that Artin Iden? Forgive me if I'm saying your name wrong. It says, everything I've done with BOFs is the OSCP style stack-based x86 BOF. What are the next steps for learning? I would like to go for the OSED someday soon. So hopefully all those acronyms are making sense to you. What yeah. advice might you have? Yeah, so my, my advice is this. So this is what's happened, right? We now live largely in a 64-bit application world, right? Structured exception handling as a vector is has you know largely disappeared because of the protections that are compiled in. Uh, stack overflow-based protections in general are much, much stronger because of uh, the uh, stack protections that are there on top of the uh, except structured exception handler uh, work. So 
where the action is uh, for 64-bit ex- a- um, applications um, today is really looking at how we can exploit the heap. Uh, and the heap is a different animal. Uh, the heap is where a lot of your uh, global variables end up uh, in an application. Uh, for example, um, if you're looking at uh, a browser, you will often see like large memory allocations from a JavaScript uh code that will end up on the heap, right? And you, and there are sometimes opportunities to exploit it. And now there are more and more heap uh, protections as well to prevent execution uh, straying off into the heap. And so this is where you end up in the world of ROP chains. And what ROP chains are is basically a way for you to go through the executable sections of any um, image and look for the op codes that you're interested in executing to achieve your goal. It's sort of like using a bunch of little baby trampolines, right? Uh, and you know that's really where you need to sort of start um, um, heading uh, when you get into the world of 64-bit and uh, uh, having to um, uh, use the heap uh, rather than the stack. And they're much more challenging exploits to develop um, and that such as such is the state of the world today. Gotcha. All right. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six more questions. Jock, Joff, can you stick around for a few minutes while we go I through? I can those or stick no? around for a few minutes. Let's do awesome. it. Awesome. So for those of you who do have to drop off and have joined for the webinar, hey, thanks for coming. You know, it's 523 is still on. I think I saw the peak get up or over 600, maybe 650, somewhere in between there. So thank you for joining us. And make sure you check out Joff's class in the Discord. We've got uh, Joff's upcoming classes for Intro to Python. So if all of this sounded interesting, and it was, so if you didn't find it interesting, uh, I don't know what's wrong with you. Uh, but anyway, you know, if it sounded interesting, <laughs> great. Come check out the class. So thank you, everyone. If you can stick around, we're going to go through the rest of those questions. Uh, And if not, enjoy the rest of your day and check out the next webcast we have coming up. And definitely like and subscribe on our YouTube channel if you're watching. And then you'll get notifications when this kind of cool stuff happens. So, Joff, the the rest of the questions here. Uh, Chris Von Raybyten, I I hope I'm saying that right as well. Would this exploit still work using SOC underscore DGRAM? Uh, no, uh, socket underscore dgram would attempt to open a UDP socket to the application. The application specifically was written to listen on a TCP socket uh, on TCP port 987. So uh, it would not accept that UDP connection and therefore the uh, exploit would not work. Very good. All right. I think you may have answered this one, but I'm still going to ask just in case it wasn't. Uh, there's two here that I think might have been answered. Uh, KitKat said, I don't understand with a buffer overflow, why would the order of the bytes matter? I thought only size mattered. I think you explained this with the Intel processors and big Indian, little Indian, but but yep. just in case. Well, uh, you got to think about it like this. You, you've got this sort of list of things and you're trying to hit a particular target that's sort of right in the middle of that list, right? You know, right at eye level, if you're looking at my hands and my face right now. And so you need to use a whole bunch of padding at the top of that list to kind of slowly work your way down to my eye level. When you get to my eye level, you need to put the correct bytes in there to represent an address for in memory uh, that you're seeking to gain execution control to. And that's where the order of the bytes matter. In the padding itself, the byte order has no significance. It does not matter at all. Uh, but for the address, the CPU interprets that in a particular order. And that's where um, when you're getting that address into the CPU registers, that byte order really does matter. Very good. All right. Uh, again, another one that I think you you mentioned, but it, it came up a lot in the Discord. Uh, Evan Karu, a C-A-R-E-W, again, forgive me if I'm saying that wrong. How does this deal with ASLR? You brought up an ASLR debugger, but um, how does the actual exploit deal with ASLR? The, the exploit makes no attempt at all to um, deal with ASLR. And in fact, if the application was fully compli- compiled uh, with address uh, space layout randomization, uh, the exploit uh, would have very little chance of working. Um, bear in mind, when uh, address space layout randomization is at work, 
um, it still is random only up to a point. It's usually n number of random locations on every execution. So it is still possible to use a brute force approach to kind of pick which one of those x or n number of locations you might end up in, but it becomes a lot more difficult. All right. So um, hacker with two R's over from a YouTube comment here. Does buffer overflow work nowadays? Websites are more secure, uh, more securely written, and the OSCP removed it from the exam curriculum. So yeah. you know, do no, you, it's do a you good, feel like it's this a, still works? It's a good point. So I want to say a couple of things about that. Number one, I used this example more to talk about the Python concepts around the exploit than the buffer overflow itself. The second thing I will say is, does buffer overflow exist anymore? Yes, but not in modern applications. So, you know, you are more likely, just as this example shows, you are more likely to find a buffer overflow in an out-of-date application that's written in uh, for as a 32-bit application that was probably first released somewhere around 2006, seven or eight, and is not something that's been released recently. Um, so. There's, there's your answer. So in terms of Python, to carry that forward, you will see much more traction doing things such as uh, cross-site request forgery, such as cross-site scripting, such as you know uh, attacks against uh, cores, headers, uh, cross-origin resource sharing, and stuff like that. You can certainly use Python scripts to perform web-based attacks as well. And we we do talk about the requests module in Python, uh, which allows you to transmit uh, HTTP and HTTPS uh, requests uh, from the Python language uh, in order to achieve some of those sorts of things as well. Gotcha. And I, I want to add in a piece there because it, does this still work? And I would turn that question around and say, depends. Are you testing an older enterprise with a legacy application? If so, bingo. <laughs> Absolutely. Bingo. I, so, I, I'll yeah. give you an example, a classic example. Uh, mm -hmm. medical facilities and public teaching universities, uh, you will find that they have things like scanning electron microscopes that have embedded controllers that are, you know, Windows XP service pack one or less, uh, or original Windows NT kernels. You betcha they're going to potentially have vulnerable applications on them that could still be vulnerable to buffer overflow attacks. Uh, that That is your typical uh, environment that you might find that on. Uh, having said that, your scope uh, uh, in any pen test might deliberately exclude some of those things because yeah. those customers generally know exactly what they're dealing with. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, Rose uh, put in there as a comment. Uh, they put probably cough nonprofits. Uh, so, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, uh, reverse one, two, three. Uh, I'm assuming it's tough to observe this exploit in Oli, uh, Oli Debug or another tool, but you, you talked about that, that you can observe it inside of there, correct? You can. Uh, you need a little knowledge of debugging, though, because what you've got to realize about a debugger is when you first put the application into the debugger, uh, the debugger itself will force the application to stop. It throws a, a debug exception is basically what it's called. And you've got to know to continue the application beyond that point, and then You've got to get a lot more familiar with the application flow in terms of um, its its actual execution as it performs various tasks, whether it's popping up a pop up and whatever. What different memory addresses and functions inside that machine code is doing that, so that you can set breakpoints in there where you can stop the application at certain points, examine memory. It takes a lot more work. Nice. Okay. And the last question here, uh, if uh, from an anonymous attendee, if I wanted to test the same things in my Windows 10 VM, where can I get this buffer overflow, which I think is is kind of kind of an interesting question, because if it's not on exploit DB, then you got to write it. But do you do you have any feedback? For, uh, uh, for it, for? I, I literally fetched it off exploit DB this week. It is still there. Oh, there you um, go. So uh, if you search for uh, Maple SNMP, uh, and then the CVE number, which I will release the slides anyway. You can see the CVE mm -hmm. number in there. You're going to find it. So you can use it as a, a case study uh, for yourself uh, as much as you'd like if you want to learn a little bit of Oli Debug. Uh, you can also put it into Windows 7 if you want. And um, if you can even find an image of Windows 7, by the way, that was a bit of a challenge for me today. Uh, I was like, oh, I got to stand up a Windows 7 to show the exploit actually might work. And it does work about one out of two times. Uh, right, but anyway, that's not bad. Yeah. 
thank you for joining us today and spending a little bit of time with us talking about Python, Python scripting overflows. Joff, thank you for your time, man. But that was a big title. Yep. Enjoyed it, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, um, always love doing these things. Hope to see you at a class soon. Fantastic. Uh, Ryan, the fire kill with. <laughs> kill with fire. Thanks for watching. Achieve your next level of skills with training courses at antisiphontraining.com.